Hello, everyone. Given the, the sophistication of the crowd, I assume you've heard about the concept of matrix power. It's one of those analytical tools that has been put forward to deepen our understanding of contemporary power in, in data practices and data regimes. Modeled around Foucault's notion of biopower, it refers to the specific forms of power over life as it appears in and through data, to the strategic forces governing the production and circulation of measures, and how they feed back into patterns of movement, behavior, and dispositions to think and act. In Baer's formulation, matrix power is based upon the creation and maintenance of limits. It carves out liminal boundaries and constrains possibilities for action by channeling activity in certain directions that shut down options and choices, diffracting them in desired ways. Matrix power then confronts us with a specific form of disciplinary apparatus as it operates through dynamic feedback patterns, the ways in which shares, links, or likes, and performance indicators feedback into social identities and situations, and establish an invisible infrastructure of social sorting and political optimization that moves the social field. What I want to do to today is complicate some of the core assumptions built into the idea of metric power. <coughs> to do this, I will look beyond the convenient sample of regularized economies under liberal capitalism and flesh out how metric power is lived, experienced, and enacted in the extrajudicial sphere of humanitarian practice and here, most specifically, in Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. What I want to show is how the quantification of social lives that have always already been counted and pushed into directions that never were of their own choosing affects modalities of struggle at the margins of the state. The main point I want to make mm -hmm. is that metric power in its current formulation rests on an all too rigid distinction between data and its subjects that is neither self-evident nor particularly helpful when trying to unpack the particularities of its enveloping grip. Measurements are never just a quantitative, but a qualitative happening. They afford new bodily ontologies <coughs> and ways of being in common that require us to consider data-based measures as coextensive with the ethical substance they embody and as inextricable bound up with and entangled with the social context from which they are drawn. But before I get into, fun, uh, into further details, a few more words on metric power, uh, on metric power as such. Within the vast body of literature on the sociology of quantification, the concept of metric power has often been framed within wider critiques of ne neoliberalization. Data infrastructures <coughs> here are seen as post-hegemonic self-organizing regimes in which the pervasive protocols of algorithmic computing and advanced data mining appear as the primary engines for inscribing logics of competition and the market deep into the most mundane corners of social life. The basic assumption here is this. Neoliberal governance demands indicators and the means by which these indicators can be contrasted and compared. Metric power, metrics, provide the effective mechanisms to achieve that and thus are essential for competition to exist. They allow for differentiations to be created and inequalities to be cemented. Consequently, then, it's in the selection, priorita prioritization, and the force of circulating measures, as Bea suggests, that we may find the operation of power perfectly realized. My main contention here is that markets and infrastructures cannot be considered as a universal totalizing structure, and nor do measures. Measures, to follow Bringenti's observation, always exist in plurals because they correspond to a multiplicity of dreams about social existence <coughs> that can never be fully resolved. And so metric power, I contend, operates precisely at this juncture of multiple tendencies and pressures in which conservative forces of custom, habit, routine run up against subversive tendencies of mimicry, disloyal repetition, and obfuscation, keeping the force and direction of metric power inherently open to diffraction, resistance, and hence change. Rather than synchronizing hopes and aspirations into, into a singular, flat, and homogenous social field, then system of measurement are indeed productive of a wide range of variously differentiated measure value environments that need to be assessed through the heterogeneous forms of sociality through which these measure environments are enacted, embodied, and lived. What limits the analytical purchase of metric power then in current accounts is that it assumes the rich, the markets of rich industrialized economies as an unspoken universal backdrop of data power, leaving less visible and provisional infrastructures of circulation unexplored. By the same token, 
the Foucauldian frame of governmentality and its elaborations in Butler's performativity led scholars to overemphasize the work on, of metrics on subjects without looking further into the less determined, contradictory, and at times, time, and at times <coughs> self-destructive potential say and gender in the exchange between the, the, the subjects and their environment. These tensions have a significant bearing, I argue, on how spaces of equivalence and approximations are established, how they are challenged and undone, but also how they are felt, lived, and embodied. And lastly, there's this constitutive split between data and its subject at work in this idea that matrix move out into the social world to shape identities and situations. Such a view con constructs data matrix as ontologically distinct preconstituted entities that have always already acquired a discrete function and characteristic before they enter into some form of exchange. So I want to challenge this constitutive split by rethinking data matrix as a living, collectively embodied form of mediation in which various systems of measurement and modes of calculation join into world-sustaining relations that enable social fields. Data infrastructures in this view are productive of distinct atmospheres of power that operate through a multiplicity of designs, bodies, and materials, and draw various social, social and technical measures into a shared operational field. I won't have time to elaborate on the ethical and political implications of this approach in much detail, but I'll leave this for the, for the Q&A session. Um, I just, on the basis of a few examples from the camp, want to flesh out a few of the main points of my argument here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this situation, but there are basically 12 Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon spread across the country, housing about uh, the numbers uh, are, are not quite clear, about 300,000 refugees. Judged by the dire living conditions of the camps, the camps appear a far cry away from the smart living, uh, from the smart city uh, as which New York, Delhi, or Dubai imagine themselves. The camps are among the most densely populated spaces on Earth, with about 3.5 square meter available per person. This is far less than the minimum space required for healthy living, according to, hum to the Humanitarian Charter of Relief. The camps have a long and complex political history, which I don't have time to explore here. But what is, what is important to note is that the Lebanese government doesn't consider the camps as part of its sovereign responsibility. <coughs> the social and economic welfare of the refugees is fully in the hands of UNRWA, the main agency in charge of Palestinian refugees in the Arab world. UNRWA provides basic shelter and food supplies, education and health care, but also cash subsidies for the most vulnerable families. Vital infrastructure services, such as water, electricity, or sewage systems, not to speak of communication networks, have to be financed through other international and local NGOs and donor funds. <coughs> Palestinians, just as the Syrian refugees, are systematically excluded from the labor market, only allowed to do menial jobs. This left the camps, by and large, excluded from the center of social and cultural life, but also undocumented, a blank space on the official Lebanese map. That's also why the number of refugees is currently completely unclear, but they are working on the census now. This, par this partial invisibility invest the politics of measurement and datification with a series of paradoxes and contradictions. The camps are on one hand one of the most over-researched communities in the region, while at the same time largely invisible and unaccounted for in the hands of the state. There are thousands of books, PhDs, documentaries, and academic studies on Palestinian camps, some of them accounting for 400 publications alone. And this pervasive presence of academic scholars, NGOs, and filmmakers has also been a source of long-standing frustration among the refugees. The intense research effort has never brought any substantive improvements, nor yielded any returns. As a result, the refugees have grown increasingly wary of any attempt to collect data on their situations. Trying to convince them of the benefits of bringing their dire circumstances to the world's attentions are usually answered with ridicule or laughter. You're just using us to further your own interests is a common complaint you get in return. Attempts to miti mitigate the extractive logic built into conventional research with participatory approaches has, little da has done little to change the situation. It simply reconfigured the uneven power dynamics between refugees and researchers um, <coughs> by, drawing the po by drawing the population into a dynamic assemblage of data sharing in which the ability to raise their voice and to, and to participate in decision making was found to impart in vital knowledge that was never available before yet without giving, uh, gaining further influence over the terms and conditions how this knowledge was then processed, used, and shared. 
Pierre Bircher no, uh, point the notion of shared beings to describe such conditions of responsibility without power. She, uh, her research is based on open data in general. Shareveillance here is a state in which we are always already shared and sharing, where sharing is, so to speak, an imperative, a default position, but where the parameters and conditions for sharing are always already laid out in advance. As such, it, conscripts, uh, uh, it can easily conscript us into political projects we may not necessarily agree with, or that simply enhance the efficiency of systems that are fundamentally at odds or contradict the pretext under which data was shared. Participatory mapping projects in the camps were caught up in a similar dilemma. They called upon the responsibility of the camp population to contribute to the collection of data that was never available. Uh, I've mentioned earlier, uh, the camps have never been documented. And UNPA has also never uh, uh, followed the gradual extension of the camps over the past 70 years. Other issues, such as the imp improvised architecture of water and electricity services, were never comprehensively studied because they are hampered by entrenched cultures of corruption, which are difficult to document and untangle for outsiders without networks of trust or insider knowledge of the camp. Sharing vital information then about the overt and covert architecture of power was essential for improving living conditions. Yet the fact that the refugees had no say in how this vital information was used created a situation in which they ended up strengthening above all the surveillance regime of humanitarian agencies, the state and the military, without gaining any substantive influence over the management of SCAR assets such, such as housing, electricity, or water in return. Instead of enhancing the ability of the refugees to participate in vital decision making and to facilitate the culture of community self-governance as initially promised, the participatory mapping projects ended up feeding into the hands of those who had always been in positions of power to control the distribution of resources and information in the camp. This also included self-appointed community leaders and the political factions claiming to represent the refugees. Some of them simply hijacked the collaborative mapping process and used their influence, influence to manipulate the data as it was collected, increasing the size of individual homes or changing the value of a business in exchange for favors and to strengthen their standing in the camp. The joint effort of documenting and evaluating in individual and shared assets and to take stock of the shared experience of forced exile over 70 years conjured up a whole new range of conflicting measures that not only, not only corrupted the data, but also undermined the process, process of greater accountability, justice, and fairness. It strengthened above, above all the civilian flip side of transparency measures without giving equivalent amounts of protection and influence in return. Based on this experience, uh, an NGO came up with another idea and developed an online reporting tool to expose mis mismanagement and corruption. Uh, the main idea here was to collect vital data so as to improve the infrastructure that has been left unattended by factions and NGOs. The project asked refugees to report burning issues and problems online as they were encountering them so that the, uh, the, the group could find a solution. It was praised as a shining example how evidence-based participatory research can help make a real difference in the lives of the refugees. And it did, in fact, lead to some big investments in new water tanks and the modernization of the electricity grid. But all of this ended up serving only one uh, or two neighborhoods, while the conditions in the rest of the camp were left unchanged. Some of the political leaders in charge of implementing the project simply redirected the funds into their own pockets, serving their own self-interest uh, instead of that of the rest of the camp. Here was not so much the lack of control over the circulation of data, but the lack of control over the last mile, the moment of its implementation, where the dynamics of power shifted back to corrupt leaders whose self-interest undermined the well-meaning intentions of the tool. What I'm hoping to show with these two examples is that while the life world and the understanding of refugees and the neoliberal citizen subject may appear markedly different and far apart, the position within heter heterogeneous sharing assemblages is nonetheless unco uncomfortably similar. To return to Birchel's early, earlier point, both are cast into the anti-politicized role of auditing entrepreneurs that the security state and non-governmental agencies have always already imagined for them and that renders them complicit in the production of political publics without true potential or force. Left without influence over the terms and conditions over which their collectively held or produced data is repurposed and used, 
the activist appeal of collaborative, uh, of collaborative data practices remains a mere historical figure with no effective leverage to convert metric power into a transformative force. It's this uneven distribution of power uh, over the terms and conditions on which data metrics are enacted and circulated that is at stake in metric power. Its tremendous capacity for manipulating and recalibrating horizons of actions and imaginations, the power to determine how lives become visible, governable, claimable, or measured for their social and cultural worth, it's not bound to economic rationalities, neoliberalism, communicative capitalism, or the sharing economy for that matter. It's a matter of operational rationalities, of the social, legal, and technical protocols that govern the flow of data, and that are built around an extractive logic that is fundamentally at odds with the social and moral contracts that sustain information networks as a lived and embodied infrastructure of the everyday. Mark Hansen brilliantly summed up the ethical implications of this, situation, of this situation when he wrote, what is at issue here is the calculated extraction of data that operates to serve the interests of the network or more exactly, the special interests controlling the network. Whatever politics will ultimately emerge from the theorization of 21st century media, we'll have to grapple with the thorny issue of how to preserve the commonality, accessibility, and openness of media in a world dominated by special interests whose livelihoods are strictly coupled to their success in appropriating data for their own private gain. The problem, I argue, cannot be solved on a level of ownership rights in data. Such appeals to rights are simply overwritten by the gross imbalance of capacities to utilize collectively held or produced data at the hands of those in control of its exploits. But it is also unhelpful because the question of ownership in the Western legal imagination, at least, is still built around the same proprietary extractive logic that currently undermines any attempt to create reclaim control over data flows. And so the question of data standards, whether open, closed, or shared, in the sense is subordinate to the question if data doesn't properly belong to us in the first place before it is shared, a point we believe made by Birchler's account. Achieving a more equitable distribution under such condition re requires to undo the ontological split between data and its subjects. It maintains a disquieting continuity with colonial logics of dispossession in the operational rationality and legal protocols of contemporary data regimes. The internet and datafication in general have turned all of us in, in some form of statelessness in our existence as data, holding us in a state of permanent temporariness as circulating forms. It subjects us to an elastic geography of overlapping jurisdictions, neither, neither of which protects and preserves our distinctiveness as a composite whole. This requires a radical rethinking of data as a lived and embodied substance, and to undo this constitutive split between data and subjects that, facil that facilitates the con continuity of dispossession and enclosure on the level of operational rationalities. Politics, after all, as Belland rightly argues, is about the redistribution of inequalities. It requires an attentiveness to the terms and conditions on which the provisional is lived, not through a simple re rearrangement of ownership and belonging, but in terms of a general reconsideration of data commons as a moving, ever evolving and shifting social infrastructure that sustains collective life. Okay, so I'll get started. Um, I'm gonna do a bit more describing than theory, so you be prepared to hear uh, a bit of description with uh, a little bit of theory attached to that. Um, so first, I'm going to take you through an introduction, talk a little bit about big data, ontology, a little bit about cheese. Uh, after that, I'm going to go into an example, uh, DARPA, Siri, and Apple, not the fruit, but the company. Uh, and then look at a case study uh, that I conducted while doing my uh, PhD research at Purdue University. I've given a version of this talk before, so I apologize to some of you if, uh, if a little bit of this is uh, overlap. Uh, so first, just to kind of start with the riddle, just get us thinking about ontology and what it means. This is kind of an old philosopher's chestnut, uh, and it goes like this. Two humans, a monkey, and a robot are looking at a piece of cheese. What is common to the representational processes in their visual systems? And so taking a minute to think about that, two seconds to think. Well, the answer, of course, is the cheese. The cheese is the same, right? We think about that. But as we know, there are lots of different types of cheeses that we think about, and we call them different things. When I lived in America, some Americans refer to American cheese as, uh, or rather a craft dinner slice as American cheese, mozzarella as American cheese, and lots of different types of cheeses as American cheese. So um, I just, the reason I showed you that uh, riddle about cheese is kind of think about 
the different ways that we discuss data, the different ways that we label data, and think about how data represent things that exist in reality. Uh, so you've probably all seen this before. This is the four big Vs of uh, big data that IBM put out. I think they're up to 16 now or something like that. Um, but what I'm interested in is in the top right-hand corner, the different varieties of data, the different uh, file formats that can be produced, the different ways that uh, individuals can label those and add metadata to them. Um, so Oracle put out a report showing that a lot of the data that's being produced uh, these days is actually not organized in any way that we can access and reason, uh, such as in a database, but it's actually just unstructured data that we might not be, be able to, um, to reason to produce uh, new knowledge. And so a lot of the data that's being produced are data that um, need, to be, need to be integrated in some form of legible way. Um, so in the literature that I looked at, a uh, term that kind of came up a few times is the Tower of Babel problem. This is how data scientists kind of refer to this problem in some of the research. And what it, what it basically expresses is that there's a need to integrate uh, different types of data, uh, different heterogeneous data sets to produce semantic interoperability. So each time a new database is constructed, there are different terms that represent uh, an ever-changing language. And so it's hard to come up with terms that everyone can agree on while we're trying to produce uh, uh, research. So there's a goal to achieve a common vocabulary when it comes to, uh, to data sorting and data integration. Um, I spent some time talking to researchers at the National Center for Ontological Research, uh, the New York State Center for uh, of Excellence in Bioinformatics and Life Sciences, um, individuals who work for companies like Articulate Software that produce ontologies, um, which I will explain in a second, uh, and especially people, uh, folks at the University of Buffalo, which was uh, Buffalo is described to me as the, the Silicon Valley of, of semantic technology research and of ontological research. Um, so I, I'll pull just sort of one quote from some of the data scientists that I interviewed, because this kind of gets to the heart of the problem. Um, I'll just read some of it quickly. Uh, so this data scientist said, I would say that the idea of making data structures cohere can be understood in two ways. One way is that you build the data, the data structure so that they can cohere. Uh, the problem with that approach is that it's expensive and it creates new errors. Every change can lead to a problem because somebody makes a mistake or some machine isn't programmed properly. The other way of making data structures cohere is to describe them in a hands-off way using a common vocabulary. The common vocabulary raises the following problem, which is that people like to use their own vocabulary. <laughs> Duh. Uh, if someone comes along and says that they know how to build a common vocabulary, which will bring about this trick of making heterogeneous data structures cohere, it's a very difficult one to carry off, and, and they continue. Um, one data scientist in the literature I read uh, said, in terms of common vocabularies, uh, there's a sort of famous quote that, that folks who write about ontology use, and it's that uh, the data scientist said, I would rather use someone else's toothbrush than use their vocabulary for how I, for how I organize my data. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how strongly people feel when they label uh, these data. So speaking about that second approach, the hands-off approach to creating a separate vocabulary, that's something called ontology engineering, uh, which is basically semantic uh, interoperability. That's the goal of ontology engineering. So the idea is rather than allowing data to pr proliferate uh, into stovepipes or data silos, uh, ontology engineers want to create uh, vocabularies that can allow them to produce new knowledge by integrating the different uh, forms of data. Um, so the way that they do that is they actually use uh, rules, first order logic, uh, analytic metaphysics, kind of your philosophy 101, things that you might find um, in a philosophy class, so things like differences between universals and particulars, taxonomies, neurology, so things that have uh, part of relationships or has part relationships, uh, topologies, about things that are boundaries of things or connected to things or adjacent to and dependence relations and those become articulated in things like Protege, which is a free ontology editing software you can use to annotate your metadata and to be able to in start integrating some of these data sets. Um, and th there are others, uh, Onto, there was another one uh, that was popular in the 90s, but Protege is one that, that uh, many folks use now. Um, the other thing when it comes to ontology research is that there are uh, these things called upper uh, upper ontologies or upper level ontologies, which are effectively um, something I discovered kind of this emerging industry where uh, data scientists are competing to see whose upper level ontology can become the de facto ontology that scientists end up using in different fields of research. What's happened is that some of these ontologies become used in certain industries much more than others. So if you look at the BFO, which is the case study that I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, the BFO tends to be used in bioinformatics research, especially, anything related to biology, and uh, fascinatingly also in intelligence, military, CIA, this kind of research, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that in a second. Uh, Doce is used for things like uh, natural language, linguistic representation, concepts, so it's a bit more language focused. Um, 
And then sumo uh, has been used in other areas as well. Uh, so the, the, the word ontology itself, you can see here, uh, is actually being used, this is from PubMed. A lot of folks, instead of using old terminology like knowledge representation or concept engineering, are actually turning to use the word ontology now to describe what it is that they do. Um, and you can see Google Ngram here has been going up. You know, from at the beginning, that's probably the philosophers talking about it, but then you can see the computer scientists really kind of bring it up um, towards the end there. Um, so one thing I, that I've had to think about recently, and if we have computer scientists in the room, maybe we can talk about this after, but what are the differences between databases and ontologies? And this is something that I've been reading papers about, and people kind of have conflicting definitions uh, on what constitutes either one. So what, what I kind of came up with is that databases focus more on data, whereas ontologies want to focus more on meaning. Uh, with databases, uh, again, these aren't, uh, don't take these as sort of zero-sum games, but um, Databases, uh, hierarchy is not necessary, whereas on ontologies, a hierarchy is necessary. You get integrity with the database, but you might not. You lose data provenance in ontology sometimes, because remember, ontologies are layered on top of the data. It's not the actual data itself. Uh, databases are good for querying, but ontologies are used to infer new information if you want to connect different databases. Uh, you won't necessar necessarily have a data dictionary with the database, but uh, comments in ontologies are actually in the, at the uh, XML file. You can actually read. Uh, the definitions. Um, and at bottom, databases are for machines. Ontologies are, are used by people as well. And that's kind of the point of an ontology is to be able to get different uh, unique teams of researchers to be able to use them. So a quick example of uh, what the problem is. So reference tracking in a database is kind of difficult. In this example here, you can see uh, it says here, Mark uh, diagnosis as chronic. And so this ontologist that produced this example says, are there really chronic diagnoses or is it diseases that are chronic? And so thinking back to some of those um, you know, first year uh, metaphysical analytic terms like, like on, um, neurology and topology, we can use that to kind of parse out what, what people actually mean when they're annotating the data. So it goes from mundane things like this to slightly larger projects where uh, folks actually produce papers trying to describe how ontologies can track every entity that exists in the world. And I've read a lot of papers like this. Some are called How to Track Absolutely Everything. Uh, and there, there are other examples of that. Um, so one quick example um, about ontology that's kind of an everyday, uh, ex uh, real world sort of focus. Um, so Thomas Gruber, who actually wrote some of the key works on ontology in the early 90s, um, actually went on to produce uh, Siri and works at Apple now. Um, Siri uses an ontology to take lots of different data from various services that have been orchestrated, and it connects it to intelligent user interfaces. And the way that Siri does that is it creates domains and task models which are essentially ontologies, right, that are used to describe the data that's contained in those services. Um, so Siri, interestingly enough, like most things related to the internet, was actually uh, funded by DARPA. A lot of that early research came from DARPA to the PAL framework, uh, which is a personalized assistant that learns. Um, so they, they, a lot of that early funding that Gruber used came from DARPA. To fund, um, to fund Siri, which, uh, as I mentioned, essentially talks of, takes uh, various APIs, treats them like an ecosystem, kind of pulls them in, and then sorts them using, using that particular ontology. So here's a quick, I'm just going to read the highlighted part here. Uh, this is Tom Gruber, one of the creators of Siri, who basically says, Siri is building on the ecosystem of APIs, uh, which are better if they declare the meaning of the data in and out via ontologies. And that's kind of Gruber's big, um, big uh, definition there. So a couple of things to say about ontology, looking at this, this example of, uh, of Siri and Apple. So Siri uses a, a closed ontology, which in the literature, in the patent literature, they call active ontology. That's just the name they give to it. We don't know how it defines entities uh, and relations, so we can't actually see how it comes up with the distinctions that it does. Uh, there are other closed uh, proprietary ontologies like Psych, which is actually a really old one that was open for a bit, but now is, remains closed. Um, Doug Lanat, the creator of that, there's a really fascinating piece that Wired uh, put out uh, of him, a profile, if you want to check that out to learn about, um, about that. Um, PALS, the semantic web, Internet of Things, Web 3.0 will continue to rely on ontologies to sort the data. So the more that we get these uh, personal assist, uh, assistance rather, and um, the, the semantic web, Web 3.0, you probably know the, the uh, W3C standards that Tim Berners-Lee is working on kind of related to these things. And effectively, ontologies are semantic layers on top of data or the internet or the web. Um, so a couple few questions that, that I'm beginning to look at, and I'd be happy to talk to people who have um, maybe an opinion on, on this, is what will this mean for those who lack agencies of enunciation once semantics is baked into the platforms? 
And um, is there a need to make explicit the ontologies of certain applications um, and platforms moving forward? So this is just a couple of shots of the patent from uh, Apple series. You can see the active ontology is kind of at the center, grouping everything in, the natural language processing, the vocabulary, uh, different domains and entities. And what, what that allows them to do is you know, create your hierarchies, ontological hierarchies of the world, your restaurants, your locations, your cuisine served, and things like this uh, inside of the, the Apple ontology. And is uh, represented in a new user face like that. Um, they've also patented an ontology for the home. So we're starting to see this Google Home came out, uses the same type of technology. So now it's, it, we're getting into categorizing your home, the uh, entities that exist, what orders they exist, and things like that. So what do what ontologies mean? Um, so I think one way that I can describe it is as the politics of search 2.0. So there's a lot of early literature by Nissenbaum, right? At the turn of the century, talking about the politics of search when it comes to Google search and items like that. But we might think about ontologies as a politics of search 2.0, what gets included, how is it defined. Um, there are new forms of ontologists, of editors, of gatekeepers, of decision makers that are responsible for making these choices about what gets included in the ontology. Uh, ontologies involve large scale cross sector data harmonization. So what happens when date your you know, data from one domain is taken from another and what type of interesting consequences uh, you know, come up from that for data subjects, grouping, correlation, maybe guilt by association once these different uh, databases are harmonized. So I'll take you through this case study that I did, looking at a specific upper level, upper level ontology called the basic formal ontology. A few research questions I had moving forward were, um, is there evidence that ontologies typify particular logics or biases? What types of data do the ontologies organize? And how are the computational ontologies applied in social contexts? Um, so I won't go through this, but some of the theoretical framework just to get the gist. Wolgar uh, in STS has talked about a turn to ontology, ontological politics, ontological organizing, um, Fleury's philosophy and ethics of information, obviously Bowker's standards and infrastructures, and, and so on. Um, so the case site of inquiry and rationale, so I wanted to look at an, a powerful upper level ontology called the BFO, which basically proposes a new way to organize data. It's used by a lot of ontology-driven endeavors throughout the world. Um, I'm actually going to skip this because I was given the five minute signal, but a little history about BFO, how it was funded, interestingly funded um, from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, but also the Volkswagen Foundation for a project called Forms of Life, which is kind of interesting that Volkswagen is funding a project called Forms of Life. Um, and it was also developed by a philosopher created BFO, which is another reason that I was interested because uh, half of my PhD was in philosophy and the other half in communication as well. Um, digital methods I'm going to skip. Um, so going through some of the, actually, I, so I went through some of the open uh, logs that the, that the data scientists use where they argue with each other about what should be included in the BFO. And I start, was reading some of those emails and going through them, and you find lots of interesting fights where they argue about what should be included, what, types of, what type of axioms they should use. And, and so you can see here they're talking about unicorns and mermaids because they're asking what should be included, what shouldn't be included in the ontology. Um, this is just what it looks like in the, in the editor. And what you find is that the BFO consists of, uh, consists of a series of sub-ontologies that try to partition reality into these different shapes and forms to things called bona fide entities versus fiat entities, uh, processes, spatial boundaries, temporal boundaries. And I was particularly interested in the fiats, or, or what you can call social ontology. So these are things that have status functions or are products of collective intentionality or constitutive rules. Um, so here's just a quick thing by Searle, describe one of the big proponents of social ontology saying, status functions are the glue that holds society together because they create deontic powers, powers that uh, work by creating desire independent reason, reasons for action. Thus social ontology locks into human rationality. Make of that what you will. <laughs> so if you look at the actual XML, you can see some of the fiats are inside. So they have roles. There's actually like definitions inside the code that calls for a role. So name, like you know who someone is, uh, what they do. Um, now this is really good for certain things. So one example is the Open Biomedical Ontology Foundry, which uses the BFO to connect different uh, biomedical databases. So you'll have you know the blood. There's, a, there's something called the blood ontology. Uh, there's a cancer ontology. All these different. Uh, types of ontologies that process bioinformatic information use the BFO to create these open data domains where researchers can learn from one another, trade their data, and do that. There's also um, other domains that more closely resemble the social 
sphere. So there's a, a spatial temporal ontology for the administrative units of Switzerland, which is the mouthful. Um, there's the, the folk, friend of a friend ontology, but the one that I'll go into with my last couple of remaining minutes here is something called the military ontology, uh, which was created using the BFO as well. This is one of the early documents that was released um, that, that went towards constructing the military ontology. It's called Horizontal Integration of Warfighter Intelligence, a shared semantic resource for the intelligence community. This came after 9-11. There was a directive from the Joint House Chiefs of Staff in the United States that actually called for this type of research, semantic research that can help integrate different databases, the CIA, FBI, and, um, and these types of things. So this is the military ontology here. And they, they say that on the website that they're using on, ontologically driven technologies to increase warfighter intelligence and to help win war. So they're using ontology to help um, do these types of things. So here's an example you can kind of go through. So uh, the ontology, the BFO in that, um, in that context might name someone like Mohammed, who's an instance of a personal name, which denotes a person who has a role. There's your fiat, your social category of a key leader. If, uh, so, and they use that ontology and connect it with different ontologies um, that the military has. So there'll be an agent ontology, an artifact. They'll have an ontology for weapons, for events, for uh, social categories and classes and things that exist. And the, the, what they're trying to do is integrate these into intelligence ontology suites in ways where this data can intermingle and they can derive new knowledge um, from doing that. So here's kind of an example of the types of data that will be interconnected once they start doing that. So you can see the items I've circled here are kind of not your, not your neutral entities, like maybe an event or, or, I'm not saying it's neutral, but like a military event, but for example, things like a political event or um, a, a governance activity, support governance activity, or surveillance capability, or an insurgent cell, and these types of entities. And if you break down further, they can, they can label it uh, organizations inside of the military ontology. To, you know, they'll label political organization or social organization or people, interestingly enough. So physicians, professional roles, physicians, professors, key leaders, mullah, tribal elder, commander. And using these categories, really structured, rigid categories to process the data um, to integrate in different ways. So, Looking at this and finding a list of all the ontologies that use the basic formal ontology, uh, you know, I basically kind of want to go through and see which ones process social data or purport to use um, terms for, for processing social data. Um, and you know, they, at the end of the day, what you find is that social ontology or fiats can potentially identify or harm data subjects through harmonization or correlation or guilt by association. Um, and so part of what I'm trying to do now is think about the different contexts that ontologies are used, and then to apply different sort of at fam you know well-known, well-trodden ethical standards to think about what types of contexts uh, those ontologies are used. So the good and bad ontologies, uh, yeah, ontologies do great things like help advance cancer research, but they also integrate social data by assigning normative rules, categories. Are the categories correct, and do they harm? These are kind of the kind of open questions. Um, that, that I'm trying to think about. So five ontology troubles to leave you with, think about uh, ontologies process social data, data subjects are often unaware. I don't know when I'm being, you know, recategorized, my database is being mixed with another one, lack of consent, no ethics reviews, normative societal categories. Um, yeah, and I guess the very last thing I'll say is this quote from John Fox from the Department of Engineering. People have described ontologies as a dark art or a black art because is it science, is it philosophy, what is it, is it engineering? Um, and so this is from John Fox from Oxford. As a user and a teacher of ontological methods in medicine and engineering, I have for years warned my students that the design of domain ontologies is a black art with no theoretical foundations and few practical principles. Without progress on the problem, I argue, many fields ranging from informatics to computer science to AI, cognitive science, will struggle to achieve their enormous potential or, do, or to do so in a way that is convincing uh, or safe. So there's that. And, and lastly, um, the, the social is not determined by the logical features of language. So that's another thing we, we need to think about. The logical characteristics of language can't represent social reality in its totality. So that's it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Morrison, and I'm from the University of Ottawa. The dark art is uh, such a great segue into my talk. I've changed the title of my talk for today uh, to Critical Data Literacy, Why and How. I don't think anybody at this Data Power Conference uh, needs convincing. I'm sure you're the, uh, already convinced 
of why we need critical data literacy. And if you weren't before listening to Monica explain about metric power and listening to uh, Andrew talk about how there are uh, closed ontologies affecting us, I think uh, we all, no matter how sophisticated we are, have a need to uh, continue to learn. I know that I do. Uh, but I do hope that I have a little bit to contribute to the question of how are we going to uh, approach uh, data literacy. So what is data literacy? I've read a few definitions. I kind of like this one from the Data Journalism uh, Handbook. The ability to consume for knowledge, produce coherently, and think critically about data. And the reason I like this one as opposed to some of the other definitions that I've seen is it brings in that concept of critical thinking. However, I would rather use someone else's toothbrush and use their definition. And so <laughs> this is the definition of critical data literacy that I'm using to explain what I'm talking about today which is the ability to understand that stories about data are developed, that data is collected by people for a particular purpose, and stories using data are told by humans who are storytellers, who have particular beliefs and values that are consciously or unconsciously influence uh, how they de develop the data sets and how they tell the stories. So to understand and learn how to critique, and also to learn how to tell our own stories uh, using data. I'm developing this as an open educational resource, so I've already shared this presentation. Uh, it's mostly a framework, so that, that actually works. It's just a PDF right now, but it is a material that you take right to the classroom uh, because, uh, as you'll see from the approach, it needs to be tailored uh, depending on which uh, educational group you might be working with. Uh, drawn heavily from the tradition of Paulo uh, Freire and his pedagogy of the oppressed, and uh, Teigl and Kirsch and Teigl, Campos and de Alviar, there's references at the end of this, have done some work on this and have actually tried to do some uh, critical data literacy based on the Freire tradition, so uh, working from there. The key concept here is that rather than starting from the abstract concepts, uh, you start from the lived experiences of the actual people. Uh, the framework that I'm using, or that I'm suggesting that my people might want to consider, involves an introduction. So most of my presentation today is going to be a sample introduction that I've developed that makes sense in my context and wouldn't necessarily make sense in somebody else's context. Uh, so this is mostly me, uh, but Teichel also had mentioned uh, in the Fourierian tradition, uh, there isn't this uh, explanation, you start from lived experience, uh, but what they had found is that there's a ne necessity when you're teaching data literacy to uh, explain a little bit about data, what it is and how it works. Uh, the investigation, thematization, and problematization stages are all straight from Ferrer, and uh, uh, Teichel had added in a systematization stage, uh, which I think is a good idea. So here's my sample introduction. Uh, this is in my context, somebody mm -hmm. who teaches Canadians in a university setting. Okay. So here is uh, two tales of one tax regime. This is taxation in Canada, and over on the left here, we've got the Fraser's Institute, famous Tax Freedom Day. Uh, so they used data from various sources and have decided that uh, can Canadians, the average Canadian, uh, works more than half of the year to pay taxes to various levels of government before you even begin to earn a penny for yourself. This is a very famous, it's iconic uh, here in Canada and has had a lot of traction over the years. It's been very effective. Very recently, uh, left, so the Fraser Institute is a right-wing think tank. Uh, the Broadbent Institute, uh, over on the right, is a left-wing think tank. And just earlier this year, uh, came out with a counter to the Fraser narrative that they call the Brass Tax, which I uh, recommend reading if you're into this kind of thing, which challenges the actual numbers behind the Fraser Institute, how they're gathering 
and putting the numbers together. And here's an example of a counter narrative. So the Fraser Institute is saying your average family makes $108,000 a year. Here's what they pay in taxes. And here they're showing, they're trying to show Canada's progressive tax uh, system. If you make little to mo no money, you don't pay taxes. And if you look at the top in um, uh, tax brackets, there's really not a lot of uh, high percentage of people there. Okay, so that's how people take various data and put it together to tell stories. But if you go directly to the data, well, the data is objective and neutral, right? You can't possibly get a slant there. Uh, this uh, section would actually, would actually work better as a live demo or if you have a lab to have the students do them themselves. Okay, so I've been thinking about taxation and uh, is the Fraser Institute right? Is the Broadbent Institute right? And I'm wondering, well, uh, who pays the taxes in Canada? I looked at OECD data. If you go to their site, they have some great data visualization tools. You can pick your data set. Uh, you can slide things around and change the years, that kind of thing. Uh, so I looked at uh, how does uh, the personal versus the corporate taxes compare, and has this changed over the years, something that both reports talk about. And here you'll see that the uh, uh, personal taxes uh, are a higher percentage of our re tax revenue than corporate, uh, but it doesn't look there's, like there's been a lot of change, a little bit of fluctuation here or there, but it looks pretty stable, right? So that's the default view when you go to the OECD, uh, but it does have a slider for the years, and because I have been around for a while, and I seem to remember stories about a decrease in corporate taxation, I didn't, I decided not to take the default, uh, but I slid uh, the years back to begin at 1965, and when you do this, you can see that personal taxes as a percentage of tax revenue have been going up, whereas the corporate tax revenues over the same time frame have been going down according to the OECD data. The point of this demonstration is that you can go to exactly the same data set use exactly the same tools and depending on your preconceived ideas about what the data ought to be showing, tell two completely different stories about what is going on in the world. Okay, uh, we like to compare ourselves on healthcare spending here in Canada a lot with the US and so I uh, enjoyed this uh, blog called Beyond Economics. And here the uh, authors uh, using some data, I haven't looked into the actual data I'm not commenting on, is this accurate or not? Uh, but he's come up with this graph showing that the US uh, spends two and a half times the OECD average on healthcare. Now I, I kind of thought it would be above average, I was a little surprised by the amount, but what I found even more surprising is that they're above average, uh, according to this graph, even on public health spending. Uh, which is not something that I've known about. So people are beginning to look at this data uh, with a critical perspective and come up with different narratives than what we might have heard in the past. I uh, looked at Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a page called Canadian Healthcare Stats uh, Comparisons. So mm -hmm. we like to compare ourselves, particularly with the US. Uh, we think that we're way better. We've got our publicly funded healthcare system. At least many of us uh, do that. Certainly that's my perspective. And I think I see this perspective reflected in this Wikipedia page. So they have this uh, quote here, most health statistics in Canada are at or above the G8 average. And someone has put together this really neat table. And if you click on the numbers, it goes directly to the data sources. So this kind of looks like this is, looks to me like above average uh, uh, for the general population data literacy skills. But what happens if you do a screen scrape and do the calculations. Well, uh, if you do the actual calculations, we're actually above average on three of the eight uh, measures that are presented uh, right there in Wikipedia, uh, which is not exactly most. So I think this il illustrates the need for data literacy because if you think that we're doing better than most people, uh, you can draw these numbers and not even do the calculations and you're thinking that three out of eight is most. Uh, then what is it that we are actually better at? Okay, well here on the left, 
Uh, life expectancy, so yeah, we're a little bit above average. It's 82.2 for Canada, 81.9 is just a little bit, but yay, good for us, we're better on life expectancy. What else are we better on? Well, the next one over is <coughs> under five infant mortality. Okay, so uh, which gets into the question of, okay, we're above average in some things, but do we actually want to be above average on all of the uh, statistics? So getting into more of the critical uh, perspective. The third one is percentage of government, government revenue spent on health. We're above average there. Questions are, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? You decrease overall revenue, keep healthcare spending the same, uh, that percentage is going to change that kind of thing. Uh, but what they don't talk about, they're saying we're above average, yay, good for us. What about what we're not above average on? Well, uh, doctors and nurses uh, per population, we're below average. Uh, the percentage of health costs paid by the government, we're actually uh, below average on. So. Uh, this is a, an example of how people are using data and yet there's a need to uh, learn how to critique the data that you're looking at and ask ourselves, not just if it's other people with their stories, but ask about the stories and the assumptions that we're bringing to the data as well. This is just one example of an approach. If you're not in Canada, this probably isn't going to make a lot of sense. So if you're in the Palestinian refugees camps, you probably want to have a completely different uh, story that you're going to tell if you want to uh, help them to develop their own data literacy uh, skills. Uh, what are some of the activities that you could do? You could do something like that. You could bring in guest speakers. Uh, so the presentations from the Data Power Conference might be a good way to introduce a top topic. Uh, you could do uh, DIY demos. Uh, so you can get the students to do a Google uh, search for tax data and limit to images. you find tons and tons of material that way and then ask them to go and find out who developed the images, uh, what is their purpose, uh, and why are they telling the story that they're telling. Uh, the, okay, so this is the pre ferrera stages. Uh, the first stage is the investigation, so you're starting from uh, the lived experience, which could be in individuals or small groups. Uh, it could be participants, although listening to Monica, I'm not sure about the PAR. You could also have the groups do it themselves uh, or teach them how to do it themselves. If it's uh, students, they could be working directly with things that are of interest to students, such as student debt, or they could be working uh, on topics of interest to uh, particular target groups, such as First Nations groups, which is huge for us here in Canada as we try to figure out how to do something about the, uh, the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. Uh, you can brainstorm social institute issues to investigate, select an issue. A classroom activity could be presenting the results uh, of the investigation. If you're evaluating this, I recommend pass-fail because uh, whether the students are going to find stuff or not depends on what they happen to select. Uh, the thematization stage, so here you're starting off with, okay, what are the problems or issues that concern us? You're a, Pal a Palestinian uh, refugee, so uh, uh, what are the things that they would like to see investigated? Okay, and then you go from there to what kind of data would help us to figure this out or to solve the problem? After you do the thematization and there's some back and forth, then you go into problematization. So then you go to look at, well, what data is out there and is it uh, uh, acceptable as it is or is there a need for more data? What can you do with that? Uh, so as an example of why you might want to start with thematization and not just uh, problematization, not just what the data is out there. Uh, so when Gwen talked this morning about the data that's out there, teen suicides, uh, and when it's the community uh, leading the discussion, they're saying, well, how about teen vitality? Okay, so the idea is not just to look for data that's there, but the data that maybe ought to be there, whether it's there or not. Uh, okay, uh, the conclusion then of this kind of exercise would be to put it all together, a synthesis, uh, to develop an action plan and some particular uh, examples if there's uh, data that's missing or problematic, if you're a Gwen, you say, well, okay, how are we going to measure uh, the uh, teen vitality and the other measures that uh, we think, uh, what we think are important? 
Uh, if it's, this is in a classroom setting, then uh, you can figure out what is the uh, assignment that will help to bring things together for students. So if, like me, you teach information policy at the graduate level, uh, you might ask students to do a policy briefing and recommendations for people um, in government. So that uh, concludes my talk with like a minute to spare, I think. Yeah. <laughs>